Church, we're so happy just to be able to spend some moments like these with you. And we are, we've been in the middle of a sermon series uh, this past few weeks called Public Kitchen, where we have been looking at some of the principles of faith that really are meant to be lived out in community. They're meant to be lived out with one another. And then when we practice these things together as a church family, it enables us to go deeper in our relationship with God and further as a community of faith, as a family of faith. And man, we've had some uh, some fun weeks. Last week, we were looking at discipleship and we talked about the four different expressions of what that looks like to be a disciple. We talked about being evangelistic, being an inviter, being one that believes that, hey, what I've got is not just for me, it's for everybody. And so, hey, would you come and see? We talked about uh, understanding mentoring and, and, and what that means and how do I find a mentor or how can I be a mentor. And we discovered that we don't have to be, you know, some sort of professional Christian walking with God for decades, but we can just be one day ahead of someone else and willing to pour out what's in our cup into their cup. And that's a mentoring relationship. Then we talked about peer to peer. Main way that we see that happen here at Cedar Crest is in the context of a life group where we're just rubbing shoulders with one another and praying for one another and walking out our faith. And then we talked about the intensive time or season of discipleship. And of course, we mentioned our Cedar Crest Discipleship School that's going to be starting in the fall. And if you're interested in knowing more information about that, there's going to be an information meeting uh, during the next service right at the 10 o'clock hour. So you can just stick around easy for you guys right after this service. Join us in 101 for some more information about the Discipleship School. But this morning, what we want to spend the rest of our time talking about is the ministry of healing. We're going to talk about the ministry of healing this morning. This is, there's so many things I could have talked about today. And as we prayed about God, how do we finish this series? How do we wrap it up? What is it that you're wanting to do among us? What is the thing that that we uh, value um, amongst us as a family that we can only do kind of when we're together with one another? And that is to minister to one another in the power of the Holy Spirit and to speak healing over one another. Some of you maybe grew up in in a background, a church background where healing was talked about and taught about and you practiced that. For others of you, uh, a ministry of healing is something that maybe you've only seen on TV and even that was a little weird and freaked you out and you're like, man, I don't know if I ever wanna be around anything like that. You know, what's next? Handling steaks and drinking strychnine poison? I mean, where are we going here, Pastor? You know, so it's, there's all sorts of different experiences, but what we see very clearly in Scripture from Old Testament to New Testament is that God longs to heal his people. And so if you're in the room this morning and you have a physical thing going on in your world or you have a mental uh, thing going on in your world, a mental illness, something you're struggling with mentally, or an emotional burden, a broken heart, something that is weighing you down, whatever healing you need this morning, I want you to know that a little bit later in our service, it's going to be an all skate is the way I like to say it. This is anybody that needs prayer this morning, we want to minister to you and we're going to ask God to come and heal you. And we've seen God do amazing things when we have these kind of Sunday mornings together. We've seen people walk out of here healed on the spot. We've seen people uh, meet with Jesus and experience his love in the midst of their pain and begin a healing process that took some time, but God began it when they took a step out of their seat and said, God, would you begin to heal me? And they received their healing over time. But we also know that sometimes our healing doesn't come until we stand before Jesus but it, and however God wants to meet you today, my belief is that this, the experience of the presence of his love for you is going to be really thick and real for you today. So even as I begin to teach, I just want to ask you, where do you need God to heal you today? Where is there a, a brokenness in your own life where you, if you're honest, you would say, man, I, if God could do something here, man, I, <laughs> I'm all for it. I, I want to meet with God. Well, hold that in your hand. Let me begin to build our faith as we look at scripture, and then we're going to finish our time today by just having some extended worship and ministry time and prayer for healing. Today is actually what's known as Pentecost. Maybe you've heard that word. Maybe you haven't heard that word. It's when we traditionally celebrate the the coming of the Holy Spirit, God's presence with us, that he would give us the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, and he would put it on the inside of believers. And that word Pentecost comes from the Greek, which means 50th or 50 days 
after Easter. That's if you count the day of Easter and then count 50 days, you land on Pentecost. It's been seven weeks since Easter. Can you believe it, man? It seems like the spring is just flown by. And so today we are remembering the coming of the Holy Spirit. But this is just a little bit of history maybe for you to to understand, especially if you're kind of a Bible nerd like me, you might appreciate this. Um, There was a Jewish festival called Shavuot, or the Festival of the Weeks, as we call it in English. And this was also a celebration seven weeks after. This was a festival that the Jewish people would celebrate seven weeks after Passover. And so obviously, Jesus and his disciples, what we just celebrated, communion, the Last Supper, that was celebrating uh, over that Passover weekend that so many uh, followers of Yahweh had come to Jerusalem to celebrate that particular weekend. And of course, that was the same weekend that Jesus would give his life, but then would be raised again to, to new life, that he would walk out of the grave and be seen by eyewitnesses. And that incredible move of God that we are now all a part of began on that weekend. And then it was seven weeks after that that they would be, uh, they would be celebrating again this festival of weeks. Um, for the Jewish people, it was a kind of a first fruits. The first wheat harvest was coming in, and they were celebrating the giving, the giving of the Torah, the law, just the, 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 the things, the commands of God that they would follow. That's how the Jewish people understood Passover seven weeks later, now celebrating not only the, the beginning of the harvest, but celebrating the giving of God's law. But if you'll remember, if you've been tracking with us over the last year, we looked at um, some prophecies in the Old Testament where God actually said, no, I, I want to write my law on your heart. I don't want it just to be outside. I want to put it on the inside of you. And so on Pentecost, for the believers, for the followers of Jesus, when the Holy Spirit came, that's exactly what happened. The law of God, the, the things of God that give us a boundary to experience the fullness of life no longer is somewhere out here. But it actually comes to live on the inside of us by the person of the Holy Spirit. So Pentecost is a special day. But also at Pentecost, we begin to see the gifts of the Holy Spirit poured out on his church. They're the gifts that we have that we're born with. Those are kind of the motivational gifts. Those are the gifts of hospitality and leadership and some other things. But we also see in the New Testament a list of gifts that are given to you uniquely by the person of the Holy Spirit. And one of those gifts is the gift of healing, among other things, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, miracles, uh, gifts of interpretation, the sermon of spirits, speaking in other tongues. There's uh, an entire list that Paul gives us. But today, again, we want to focus in on this gift of healing that God wants to pour out in his community. Because at the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, what we see in Scripture is that two things began to happen. As the people of God went out, they did two things. They proclaimed that the kingdom of heaven had drawn near. In other words, you can know Jesus. You can have a relationship with him. The Holy Spirit is here with you right now in this moment. And the second thing that they would do is they would pray for the sick and the power of God would come and many would be healed. And those that were not healed on the spot would encounter the love of God. They would know that they were not alone in their pain and that God was with them. And so I wanna read for us two scriptures. I wanna begin in the Old Testament and then I'm gonna read from the New Testament to reveal to us again our Father's heart for bringing healing in our lives this morning. Let me just begin by reading in 1 Samuel chapter 1. We're going to be reading in verse 3. This is a story about a man named Elkanah and his wife Hannah. And there's a lot of scripture here, so bear with me. It's, it's a story, and so it should flow pretty easy. It's not, uh, it's, this is not like reading through Romans, where if I read this, this many verses in Romans, you, your mind would explode. You can't hold all that in. This is in story form, so hopefully this is going to work a little better. So follow along with me, beginning in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Uh, Verse 3, year after year, this man, that was Elkanah, went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. So again, year after year, this is a festival time. The scriptures don't, don't tell us what particular festival they were going to celebrate, but it could have been Shabbat. It could have been this this Pentecost season of year where they would go on these particular festival days. They would leave their homes and their little villages, and they would make their way to worship. Shiloh is where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. Remember, this is previous to the temple being built in Jerusalem. This is long before that, and so this was a holy place for them to worship. Verse 4, whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Paniah, and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah... He gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. 
Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. It doesn't tell us who her rival is, but we, we can kind of read between the lines and see that Elkanah had two wives, and so it's an assumption that the other wife was the rival of Hannah. This went on year after year, and whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her until she wept and would not eat. Remember that. Her, her pain is to a place where she just doesn't even want to eat. God, where are you? Where are you in my pain? Maybe you're in that place this morning, if you're honest. There's something that you've been wrestling with in your own life. Again, it could be a physical thing, an emotional thing. And sometimes you just don't even have an appetite to eat. You're so tired of fighting it. You're so tired of the uphill battle. You're so tired of the fights with this particular loved one that you just want to be in right relationship with, and yet the relationship remains broken. Let's read on. Verse 8. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now, Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. And in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant but give her a son then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. What she's talking about there is the Nazarite vow. This was a symbol when someone was committed to the Lord. They would never use a razor. They would never shave their head. It was a, a special way of living for the Lord only. Verse 12, as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth, and Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk. And said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked for. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And then she went away and ate something. She went from not eating, just totally down, uh, downcast in spirit and in heart, to an encounter with believing, I've, I've laid my heart out before God, now I trust him with it. And so she begins to eat something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord, and when they went back to their home at Ramah, then they went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. Samuel sounds like uh, the Hebrew word, which means heard by God. And so she literally named her son uh, Samuel, which sounds like God heard me. God's heard me. He's, he's heard what I have asked for him. Here's what I love about Hannah's a moment here is that she went full of faith that God can heal me, God can meet me, God can open my womb. It's God's hands that I will put my life in. But notice that her healing didn't come right on the spot. It began on this particular day. She began to even uh, expect and, and operate as if she had received her healing, but it was obviously at the very least nine months later. It may have been even more. It doesn't tell us the exact amount of time until Samuel came into this earth. But she was willing to pour out her heart before God and say, God, it's only you that I can trust in. Will you meet me in my place of need? Are you pouring out your heart to God? Maybe you've poured out your heart previously and uh, haven't seen something happen. And in today's culture, we just, man, we just want it to happen right away, don't we? It's so hard to continue to trust and to continue to believe. And I want to encourage you this morning that God is asking some of you to believe again. To trust me, God would say, that I have not left you, that I am with you, if we'll only lean in. Let me tie this, this passage from Scripture in the Old Testament to the New Testament by reading a completely different story out of the book of Acts, but you're going to see how the two are tied together here in just a moment. Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, this is right after Pentecost has happened. Acts chapter 2 is the moment of Pentecost, what we are remembering today. The Spirit of God has been poured out, and then right out of that... Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, 
And there he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk, and then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And then all the people, when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Listen to this in verse 24. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. That story of Hannah believing God to be good, believing God to be the one who saw her need, who poured out her heart, even as her rival was giving her a hard time, even as she was so distraught and and did not want to even eat, she pressed in. She went into the temple of the Lord, and she said, God, here I am. You see me. And her, her lips were just kind of moving. She was praying in her heart. She wasn't even praying out loud to the point where Eli thought she was drunk. But because God saw her and put his hand on her, and because she continued to trust that he was faithful she saw her, uh, her fulfillment, what she had asked for by being given a son, Samuel. And from that day until this day in history, right here in Acts where I'm reading, it says, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets have spoken, have foretold these days. What have they foretold? That the kingdom of heaven had drawn near. That God himself was among us now by the person of the Holy Spirit. And wherever believers go, wherever they set their feet, they can pronounce two things. You can know Jesus, and Jesus wants to heal you. Jesus wants to meet you in your place of need. Guys, what do we learn from these two passages? We learn that God's heart is to heal his people. That's his heart. Now remember, this is not some sort of ATM machine where you just plug in your pin code and then out comes the healing. Sometimes God heals right in the moment. And this morning, there's gonna be some of you that are gonna be healed on the spot right here, and it's gonna be amazing. We've done this many times, and we've had people with back pain say, I walked in here, and my, I couldn't even sit in my chair. My back was hurting so bad. I came forward. I was prayed for. I felt a warm heat all of a sudden come on my back, and now all my pain's gone. Praise God. Amazing. And that's going to happen. That kind of thing is going to happen to some of you today. Just like the, the beggar who was sitting there had no idea what was about to happen. In the moment, as the believers went to the temple, and they saw him sitting by the road, they said, stand up and walk, and he received his healing in the moment. That's gonna happen for some of you today. For some of you, the healing process is gonna begin today. For some of you, it's gonna be a situation like Hannah. You're gonna come to the front, and you're gonna pour your heart out to God. And you say, God, here's my place where I need you to show up, and if you wanna meet me right here in this moment, I'll receive it, but God, I'm in it for the long haul. However many months or years it's gonna take, whatever you wanna do, God, I will trust you in the same way that Hannah trusts you. Will you just come and meet me in this place? I don't know if God's gonna heal you in the moment today or whether he's gonna begin a healing process in your life, but we believe that God's heart is to meet you and to minister to you and to heal you and to bind up the brokenhearted. This is what God does. He binds up the brokenhearted. He takes the pieces of your heart that are broken, the pieces of your faith that are just like, I don't even know if I can believe it again. And he begins to put them together. God moved as well when they went to worship. Do you notice that it was when Hannah went to the temple? It was when the believers were on the way to to the temple to pray. God moves. There's something that happens personally when we gather corporately. God moves in our midst. His presence is here to move. This is why we're including it in the public kitchen, because it happens when we get together. When the people of God gather, whether it's at a, at a home for a life group or whether it's here in the church building, the, the building, the geographic place is not what's important. What matters is when believers gather together, God is there in a way that ministers to our hearts and we begin to minister to one another. As I mentioned, some are healed on the spot, some are healed over time. One of my favorite pastors said it this way, God is not so much concerned with time as he is with timing. He's not so much concerned with time as he is with timing. Do you know that God is working an amazing plan for your life? And as the old gospel song says, he may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. 
Our time and his time are sometimes two different things, but his timing for you is perfect. Our responsibility is not to try to figure out his timing. Our responsibility is just to come and say, God, here I am. Here's where I need you to move in my life. Will you, will you move? Will you meet me? You're seen by God. Your life matters. You're important to God. And so this morning, we're just going to celebrate. This morning, we're going to ask him to come, and we're going to ask him to heal. Do you know that our entire goal for you as we prepare every week for church is God help us to prepare an environment where your people can have an encounter with you, the living God. That's all we wanna do when we gather on Sundays. That is our prayer. God, give us an encounter with you. Oh, it's great to learn some things from scripture. It's great to sing some songs, but there's other environments where those things can happen. And of course, we teach the, the word of God. In fact, I've just laid out for you scripture, Old Testament and New Testament about the heart of God. You, you're hopefully, you're, you're, your faith is being stirred for what God wants to do in your life right now. But the most important thing that can happen when we gather in this place is that you can be reminded that God is alive, he is real, that he sees you and he wants to draw near to you. We want you to be able to leave today knowing that you have been held in the palm of God's hand. And so here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna pray and the band's gonna be coming back out as I begin to pray here in just a moment. And we're just gonna go back into a time of worship and we're just gonna begin to worship God in the same way that Hannah went to worship and the same way that the apostles were on their way up to the temple to worship. And it was in that place of worship that then healing began to happen. And so we're gonna worship together a song and then I'm gonna come back up on the stage and then I'm gonna begin to, to lead us in a time of response for healing. And so you're gonna have an opportunity to respond this morning if there's anything in your life that you need God to touch. If you need healing in any way, physical, mental, emotional, doesn't matter, some family relationship, this is the day. This is the day to get before God. We know that he wants to meet you. So would you just pray with me here and then we'll, be, we'll respond in worship and then we'll move into some time of ministry of healing. God, thank you that you give us your word. And thank you that what happened these thousands of years ago wasn't just for them. That it's for just as much today as it was for Hannah and as it was for the man who was born lame. You're wanting to pour out your spirit of healing on us today. And so, God, I just want to pray right now for anybody in this room that is saying, oh, man, do I dare believe? Do I dare trust? Do I dare risk again to, to put my heart out there that God might want to meet me? Lord, would you speak and minister to all of our hearts, but specifically for the person who's just, man, can I trust God with my place of need? Lord, I know that you long to minister to our hearts today. And so, God, I ask that as we sing now, in this next moment, that you would meet us, that you would heal your people. In Jesus' name we pray.